police diagnostic center for weeks and we are just informing us for misery not. Where is the diagnostic center? So we summoned him to come and address our flats. And of course, he came humbly and said, you know, assured us that he was doing everything possible to make sure that the diagnostic sets were procured by Ministry of Education and they would be made available to us. I don't know whether Professor Kilawa I do remember, but I raised my hand. Said, excuse me, sir. And then he says, yes. He said, you know what, Professor? You're just been frozen. Diagnostic said, diagnostic said, diagnostic said, every time you come here talking about the same thing, we don't want any problems. We want the diagnostic said. And everybody clapped, yeah! And was going back there. Again, we were able to take on the team. But possibly because we wanted to learn. So that's the difference. I can tell you also another little story about our class. When it was time for anyone to admit any units to which are on call, I can tell you, if you arrive one hour late, you find all the cameras have been put on by the police. Especially we had the my time, we had the Habib Munshi and also Patel uh, Sanjay. So these guys, they would just go there and see which patients needed to be calculated, IV line. They would quickly put all of them. So if you are late, you are eating too much, you are always in the dining room. You find that all the calculations have been done, all the investigations have been done, and then you have lost. So we made sure that each one of us were on time to do these things. I'm mentioning these things because nowadays, how many students go there and fight to do a calculation? How many students fight to do the investigation? They are not there. But our class was very, very, very different. And I think we are outstanding. And to that effect, ladies and gentlemen, not to bore you with a long story. I can say our class now, Welcome with Professor Goma on board. We have now three professors in the School of Medicine from our class. <laughs> Just to let you know that we are champions, our class team, football team, was never beaten from third year up to seventh year by champions. <laughs> no, I'm telling you, we are champions. Anyone can challenge me here. We were champions. That was a sweeper. If he misses the ball, at least he will have caught you. <laughs> and I was called, of course, I was the, the biggest striker. I was called a lot of goals. We have shared many life moments, heavy moments together with our friends, all these people that I've mentioned. And we could say that we have moved as friends. We never looked at our soldiers from the east or from the south. Everything was really never mattered. So that's the way we have been. And today is a privilege for me that I'm able to chair the proceedings of not only a <coughs> classmate, but a colleague in the profession. So that was a bit about um, uh, Dr. Koma. Now let me quickly go to the first page. That was our friends, and we are now the official heart of the league. Sorry, today you needed to be told some of these things because there are a lot of things that you take for granted. But I am just telling you that people have come a long way and uh, it's just repeating that they are honored in a special way. So, who is uh, Pastor Go? Well, Pastor Go went to the two primary schools, Mabinga and Ibanga Primary School in, in Chama, Chief Chief. Now, all those things, we are just names, I don't know. He <laughs> later on, as he passed his grade 7, he went to Chasa Secondary School, ran by the Marriott Brothers. That was in the Sinda, Eastern Province. And from there, I suppose he went to National Service, and then finally to Unza, which was the only university at that time. And that's uh, where we started our competition. One in Lusaka, Pastor graduated with the Bachelor of Science in Human Biology, School of Medicine, and then MBCHD. This was 1985, 1988. He graduated with MBCHD and was forced to do his internship at the University of Washington, where his power hungry education continued because he became the president. 
this uh, what you call the resident medical doctors association, and of course, being me and in the in the, the, the Copperfield House is vice president, so I'm also a military. So, <laughs> so after that, uh, Doctor uh, Goma um, then was uh, appointed as an SDF to do his studies in England at the University of, um, this is uh, as a research fellow at the University College London and there he was at the Hunter's Institute for Cardiovascular Research University College Hospital in London and that's where he did his thesis master's looking at the heart and the ischemia, that is blockage of the blood vessels. And he's going to talk about that later. After his master's, he went to work. He proceeded, he never came back. So he stayed a little bit longer <coughs> and proceeded to do his, his PhD, Doctor of Philosophy, at the University of Leeds. Incidentally, that's the university where I did my master's. So when I left, he says, no, I'm moving over to Leeds, where I'm going to continue my PhD again in cardiovascular uh, science. And that's where he obtained his PhD. And that was in 1998. He came back shortly thereafter and joined the School of Medicine as a lecturer. And since then, he has never looked back. It has been a very exciting journey. Of course, during this period, at the university from 1999 on his return. He has also attended a number of reputable uh, courses for which he has been granted uh, some recognition. And this included Global Tobacco Control Leadership at John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, John Hopkins University in Baltimore, USA. He has also done the management of higher institutions of, of learning which was offered at Gallery International College, Netherlands, Israel, and also Human Resources for Health at Dalhousie University, Canada. He has also attended uh, courses in tobacco dependence and uh, treatment in Toronto, Canada, and also has a certificate in international public health uh, at the University of Alabama at Benetton. And of course, because of his work in the science arena, he has been a given academic honors and awards. And among these, which needs to be uh, talked about here, that is a, a member of the National Academy of Medicine, uh, class of 2015, of which he, that's a picture on the program day. And this was confirmed. Uh, on the Constitution House, Washington, United States of America. And that was the award, very prestigious award, National Academy of Medicine. And then, of course, he's also a fellow of the Zambia Academy of Sciences. Recently, of course, as LS this week, I think that was a post that he has also been awarded the WHO Award for Outstanding Scientists in this area of tobacco and prevention of heart diseases. So ladies and gentlemen, apart from having practiced here and before at St. James Hospital in Leeds, Dr. Goma also does his own private practice of which he has a number of, of times. And we could say that in his academics, not only has he been a, a publisher, but he has because of his, uh, his achievements in the academic arena, he has also been appointed as external examiner for the University of Zimbabwe College of Health Sciences. Now, the University of Zimbabwe is just like our University of Zambia, where he continues to, uh, to externally examine Bachelor of Science and Master uh, of Philosophy in Human Physiology. So this is the person today, ladies and gentlemen, we are celebrating. But he has also been appointed external examiner for the University of Kwazulu-Natal in South Africa. Again, 
in the field of physiology. And of course, not to mention so many professional affiliations. Hey, all these affiliations, yeah, like Pan-African Society in Africa, the African Heart Network, World Heart Federation, World Congress of Family Physicians, Canadian Coalition of Global Health, and all these have actually <coughs> been in the field of hypertension and uh, cardiac medicine. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the person we are celebrating. For me, not only as a friend, but now as Jean School of Medicine, I'm very privileged to introduce you, my friend, but also an academic colleague, Professor Pastor Minga Kagorogosi. Go. <laughs>
but I've told them that I cannot be a public health man because public health is all about county toilets. <laughs> <laughs> I hope that doesn't give him ground for saying funny things. I can see that he's on the program. <laughs> you won. <laughs> you blasted out <laughs> now. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, let me start by telling you about my journey towards where I am. Really, it has been said that my start was the University of Zambia. I'm very, very proud of this institution, and I think we hold true to our model of service and excellence in every way. And I should be thankful that I was given this opportunity to get into a field which is rather rare, the field of physiology. But I want to start by showing this slide, just to quote what Einstein once said. He said, and I quote, if I've been able to look far, it's because I've, been had, I've had the opportunity to stand on the shoulders of giants. And here is my giant. Derek Yellow was my supervisor at the University College London, first college of the University of London, and he taught me critical thinking, he taught me how to relate science to medicine. And we started off this journey by looking at this phenomenon of what is called precondition of the myocardium. The myocardium is the heart muscle. Now, what was the basis of our research? This research was commissioned from the observation that if someone has had a giant, if someone has a chest pain, and you suspect he has heart disease, and he ultimately has a heart attack, that person would fare much better when you are admitted to hospital than someone who has a heart attack and has, had, has never had, has never had a giant. Everybody thinks that this guy is fine. One day, boom, severe chest pains, he gets into hospital, he may be in heart failure, they have to do a lot to get him out of there. And yet this guy was complaining of these chest pains and has been under treatment? No, boom, no, I think I just failed to know the pain today was worse than before, and it has been on for more than 30 minutes. You do your investigations, oh, you had a heart attack, let us treat you. That person would fare much better. Now the question was why? And the answer was seen. The heart which has repeated injury from ischemia prepares itself for that big event. So that when the event occurs, the heart is prepared for it and it defends against it. It defends itself against much injury. And so this guy said, okay, if that's the thing, then let us try and investigate this in the lab. That was the paper that we produced after those tests. What did these tests involve? These tests involved operating on rabbits. That is why when I tell someone that I said I'm a heart specialist, they ask me, do you operate on hearts? I find it very difficult to answer. <laughs> because in the veterinary field in London, I was known to be the best cardiothoracic surgeon they had. <laughs> I would operate on these rabbits, I would actually play around with their coronary arteries, and they would recover very well. I would take them back to the animal house, they would live another two, three days before I harvest their hearts and put their face on. <laughs> and so in terms of recovery, actually, I was an excellent surgeon, okay? And I always boasted in the laboratory that, you know, I was more prepared for cardiac surgery in rabbits than most of the best surgeons. <laughs> Because some of the best surgeons needed to have an anesthetist in the theater. I was the anesthetist myself. So when I get into the theater, I was actually literally alone. Okay? I had to anesthetize the rabbit, I had to operate on it, I had to make sure it recovered. 
My wife obviously doesn't have very fond memories of those days. <laughs> because Saturdays and Sundays I'd go into the animal house to go and give them injections, to go and give them antibiotics to make sure that the wound was not infected and things like that. But that's where I started from. Now, a physiologist is different from a physician, I've always said. For physicians, I think it should have been enough for them to say yes. There is a seven window of precondition. It comes in 24 hours and it actually disappears at 96 hours. For the physician to say, well, that's it. A physiologist always wants to ask the question, how does that happen? What is the basis for this protection that we are seeing? And so when we looked at the different mechanisms, we hypothesized that actually there was a protein that could have been produced that led to the protection of the myocardium against better injury. What was this protein? We didn't know. But we suspected that the mechanism of producing this uh, protein involved a second messenger called protein kinase C. And so we said, okay, if protein kinase C is involved in this pathway, what happens if we knock it out? And so, we used a drug called pyrethrin to actually knock out protein kinase C in these uh, rapids. These were results from my Master of Science dissertation. And they preconditioned them, there was no protection, just as we found in the sham is significant. Prof. Michel, you see my p-values. <laughs> <laughs> and so, from these studies, where is still going on to try and find a drug that can, can manipulate this protein kinase C and prepare the heart for an event such as area of the cells? I'll go back to UK sometime later. But now I'm back in Zambia. And when we came, when I came back into Zambia, we were at the peak of the HIV epidemic. And that, I think, occupied most of my time as we were trying to get antivirals on, uh, on the ground and uh, letting uh, people uh, live. But it got us to working again at the level of the cells. We went to cellular level and said, OK, guys, how shall we uh, attend to the problems that are affecting our people within the cardiovascular arena? And uh, Professor Raj, from Brighton, uh, Sussex University in the UK. The one who started this whole thing. They said, well, why don't you look at the phenomenon of uh, endothelial dysfunction? I thought, Raj, we don't have equipment yet. He said, well, it's just a thought. But I think that you have specimen on which you can work. We need to find out what is happening. Now, when we looked up into the whole arena of uh, endothelial dysfunction, we found that there was quite a lot within that area. Not only was it affecting people who have HIV and on antiviral drugs, but it was something that was affecting the people with high blood pressure as well. Most of the uh, strokes we were having were related to the period of And so we thought, well, we have to look at that. Lately, we've gone forward to look at the period dysfunction again, looking at issues of inflammation and what is called oxidative stress. And those, I think, are the two issues that took us to Vanderbilt, and two of my PhD students are working on those phenomena right now. And one of them, actually, is looking at what is happening in these people who are in diabetes. Now, type 2 diabetes is very common in people uh, who are obese. It's very common. And we always think that thin people should not get type 2 diabetes. But actually, they do. Okay, and we hear there's a very big load uh, in India of lean diabetes. But we also have them in Zambia. What is happening at cellular level? One of my students is talking about that. Uh, we had a look at chronic hypertension, and then we had to go into Ox and Grain as well. Now, there's very little crossing over between disciplines. Physicians want to keep to internal medicine, and surgeons want to keep to adult, uh, the adult side, but obstetricians in their area, but I can tell you that obstetricians fear science. <laughs> and 
So, when they have this disease called preeclampsia, they can't think beyond sorting it out. Take the baby out quickly, quickly. Okay? And so quickly, someone goes for a seat. But we are saying, no, no, talk to us. We will have solutions to this problem. And so, I can see Professor Parika relaxing now and smiling. <laughs> we mean well. So, I have already said how relevant it become to the adult infectious disease hospital, not only looking at the outcomes for our antiviral therapy, but looking at the science to be, 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 uh, behind uh, HIV and the injury that it does cause to the body. Now, the issue of our research in endothelial dysfunction, I think, is an issue that we need to talk about, talking about university and the way it does things. Now, the thing about the compliance is that, yes, it's a very nice instrument, but it's only to be used in the hands of very fine scientists, and I always want to post about that. In Africa, we are, the, we are only three laboratories which have this equipment. So I want to say, well, thanks, Unza, you opened the doors for us. We have a laboratory now which is doing research in uh, endothelial dysfunction, and it's research that is being recognized everywhere in the world. Why? Because there are only a few hands that can handle it. And I'm thanking my students again for being courageous enough to learn to use the complier and to bring out the results. These are the different sites of the complier. This is the machine that measures Velocity of blood flow. Okay, how does blood flow from the heart coming down either to the arm or to the uh, femoral vein, uh, to the femoral artery? What we are trying to find out is the speed at which the blood moves has a way in which it tells us the health of the blood vessel itself. If the blood vessel is very stiff, then the blood moves faster. That is not good because it leads to injury, which may actually predispose uh, the blood vessel to what we call atherosclerosis and predisposes to getting clots in the, in the bloodstream. See, pumping and relaxing, pumping and relaxing, okay? Because it tells you, you know, uh, LVET is left ventricular ejection time. This is the time taken for the heart to pump blood out, and DT is the actual time, the time that the heart takes to relax. And this curve is just showing the, the pulse wave, okay? The pressure with which the blood vessel is descending, okay? And this should make a physician happy, okay? But for the physiologist, it gives us, you know, reason to calculate mean arterial pressure. Now, this machine measures what we call central blood pressure. Not the blood pressure you get by putting a cup around. If you are very fat, sometimes the fat cushions most of the pressure in your car. This machine gets blood pressure from inside the blood vessel itself. So we believe that that is the real blood pressure. So it gives you the mean blood pressure, but it also gives you on top there what we call the augmentation pressure. And from the augmentation pressure and the pulse pressure ratio, you can calculate what we call the augmentation index. Very good science, and it should make every student this is something to look forward to when it comes to research <coughs> and medicine. We were told that you know it's difficult to get these stresses in pregnant women, but then I think we found a way of recording or getting good records from pregnant women. And this was one of our recordings from the UTH. So if this research is going on everywhere, why are we interested in the research ourselves? Well, one thing we must know is that black patients are not like any other patients. Blacks are a special species. <laughs> okay? Now, <laughs> we always have to appreciate that. When I was in the UK, people were saying that you know, say, say, black, say some, someone is black was offensive. But they couldn't find another way for me. <laughs> <laughs> Because my, my boss, I told you, I showed you the, the name of my boss, Derek Yellow. He was actually an African. 
okay? But it's South African white. So they couldn't say the African in this part because they'll say which one. <laughs> <laughs> then they said, no, here, you know, we'll be saying, no, a person with color. <laughs> they said, I'm not color, you are black. <laughs> okay? And so we need to have a closer. So when we look at pulse wave velocity, pulse wave form, wow, how much is it like in that? We must ask this question and ask this generosity. Then, as I said, there's a whole issue here of uh, pregnancy induced hypertension. We belong to a group which, which is called ending eclampsia. We are determined to get rid of eclampsia. And I think we will make headways. One of these days, there will be no preeclampsia in Oxford Guy. Then the obstetricians, I think, will learn how to enjoy themselves there. Because for now, I think it's a thorn in their face. And then, Talking about tobacco, we also wanted to see what tobacco does to this pulse of form and pulse of resistance. So we have papers, okay, on all these areas. Please just go to our corner, you see them coming out in millions. <laughs> <laughs> Muscle cell physiology is another area that we have been looking at. I'm still looking at talking about us working at cellular level, okay? So here, we have been working on uh, uterine and intestinal smooth muscle. Again, we had to get into that field because of what was observed. Traditional healers or traditional beta attendants have been using a plant called the pure water. If you are in Germany, it has different names in different parts of Zambia. But in Oxygen Guinea, they call this the African Zitosa, okay, or Hepopitosin. This drug is given to women in labor and it actually makes the uterus to contract better. Okay? Yes, it helps them deliver, but in some women it makes them actually end up with torn uterus. And so when we were told about this drug, we said, okay, it's a good thing that is used, but what exactly is it? How does it work? And does it work at all? And so, we got into an area that's called indigenous knowledge systems. I know that Zambians would want to uh, call it intangible heritage. <laughs> <laughs> it's not. This is proper indigenous knowledge systems. Okay? Because people have said this drug works. So when a woman is in labor and she's struggling, give it to her. It will help her deliver. And it's the same plant that is being used. And so we've taken this Yopola thing, and what made us actually work on it is because we have instruments in our laboratory, but it has probes which you can use for fine measurements of muscular activity. So that's one of the traces. So we are using our own equipment, so to say. And one thing we have to do here is not to cross fields. So we needed to have a botanical botan board, and so we went to the School of Natural Sciences, Department of Botany, and found uh, someone to join our team from there. So you can see here, uh, Dr. Chuga, and he went out into Chogun to go and collect this drug. Just showing you that we have areas in which we can form collaborations within the University of Zambia, expand our research arena and do good research. We collected the samples from there which we put in our herbarium. I'm sure the people from Natural Sciences or Professor Sigaula is here. We'll be happy to see those pictures. When we were doing that, he was uh, the dean for the School of Natural Sciences. And so we can actually put this uh, medicines within our herbarium and use them to try and find out how well they are doing uh, in the research field. We go to the Department of Chemistry, again, uh, University of Zambia uh, School of Natural Sciences, and Dr. James Irena there joined our team to actually do the extraction of uh, the active ingredient from the roots. And so, three methods. One method gave us 
that compound, another method gave us that compound, another method gave us this compound. Which means that we actually have of sources. Okay? Much better than the manufactured one. Because the manufactured one, you need to give it as an injection. This one is given, or right, it's given for someone to drink. Definitely better. And so we thought, oh, we have a drug on board. How toxic is it? Because when you talk to the traditional beta tenders, they are giving different doses. Some give it in cups, some give it on plates. <laughs> and some even put in some rituals that you know, the woman must stand at the door and face east. <laughs> so, you know, I think that is where I've been the line now. But we looked at the process, okay? So we subjected uh, rats again to increasing doses of this drug. We actually increased the dose, the maximum dose that we could, not a single rat died, which means that it's a very, very safe drug. It has a very wide range of safety. So we have on our hands actually a very good drug, which we can easily package and commercialize. So we are on our way to patenting this drug. First one probably from the University of London. Let's move away from the lab, let's be getting to the clinic. I need to be racing to the uh, racing one. On the clinical arena, I got into the University of Leeds to study electrophysiology. Okay? ECG. That was my main reason for getting there. When I got there, my boss was uh, a doctor from Iraq, Dr. David Mary. When I got there, this man said, we need to investigate one phenomenon. And this is what is called airport angina. Okay? There are people who have coronary artery disease. Every time they are at the airport, they complain that they have chest pain. But then it's only when they are carrying a briefcase in their hand. If they don't carry a briefcase, they don't have their angina. He said, well, that is what I think as well. Our friends have done experiments and they are saying actually there are no ECG changes that are associated with carrying the previous. There must be additive effects. And nobody can say it's not true. But well, the findings are like what we are telling you. They have their p-values. Okay. And so we got down to thinking about what exactly was going on. What would have happened for them to have gotten their results? Because their results are wrong in terms of science. We found that the routine test which was being used to test for quangina uh, was what was called a Bruce protocol. You walk on the treadmill, okay, at a particular incline for three minutes. Okay? And after three minutes, it increases speed and it also increases incline. You continue walking. After three minutes, it increases speed and increases incline. Okay? Until either you get chest pain, you get signs of angina, or you just say, guys are tired. Okay? So it says, okay, what's the problem? The problem was that it had a lot of false negatives and false positives. You couldn't actually put your hand on the cruise protocol and say, yes, this person has coronary artery disease from using that test. Because ultimately, for us to have angina, we must push up what is called the double uh, product, okay? Or some people call it the red pressure product. The, that's the uh, mathematics between systolic blood pressure and cartilage, okay? And we actually did come up with a methodology that could make the exercise additive, and yes, physiologically improved that you dynamically you would actually make the outcomes also active. After that then you said okay let's go and get on to the coronary artery disease patients. Let's exercise them and let's see if we have electro physiological changes. And surely we did make physiological changes. So we came up with what was called the ECG stress protocol. Okay? Now at that time I became almost a, a few months I 
appearing on the one TV program called Genius. Okay, when Genius meaning they are showing the University of uh, the St. James's University Hospital, they would come to our lab and there would be one woman there on the treadmill. <laughs> Exciting these guys. But nevertheless, we did commercialize it and it didn't go very far. So that was my second scope. Doing research not for the sake of the people, but just doing research so that it would bring in a clinical application. Ladies and gentlemen, we are back to UTH. As I said, came back in 1998. Within the clinical practice field, I've been very, very interested in hypertension, high blood pressure. Again, we've been doing some normal research within the blood pressure area. I already talked about us being involved in uh, maternity, again, uh, hypertension. But here, our research was again boosted by the cardiovascular lab that we set up. I already told you of one machine there called the Compliant. This is the second machine that we got there called the Diasis Integra 2. This small machine. This small machine is able to record 24 hour blood pressure. Okay? Now you say, well, there are a lot of 24 hour blood pressure machines. Yes, there are a lot of them around. This one is special in that it measures what is called the QKD. Now, the probe which is placed on the scanner, on the uh, breast bone, that probe is not normal. Okay? It's not found in the other 24 hour blood pressure machines. Is found only in this type of machine. And it's here because we are not only interested in what happens in 24 hours, but we are also interested in electrophysiological changes. The QKD is a measurement of the duration from the beginning of the QRS uh, complex to the appearance of the blood core sound. Okay, so uh, the uh, cardiovascular students, of course, will understand that. But that measure, is very special, okay, in that it gives us clear information as to what is behind the hypertension that we are trying to treat. We are using this machine again to try and understand preeclampsia failure. Because we know preeclampsia is not normal high blood pressure, it's not. Now, how well does it show the phenomenon which we find in other blood pressure? One phenomenon is that of dipping. If you look at blood pressure in 24 hours, at night, blood pressure naturally comes down. Okay? We call that the night tip. It's a very good sign. Now, we have the 24-hour water monitor, which you can use. I don't have a picture here. Why? Because it's borrowed. <laughs> Not that we don't like borrowed things. Sure, everyone knows that I don't buy what I can borrow. <laughs> <laughs> Well, including the gown I'm wearing today. <laughs> uh, I must say, uh, I think I've already said that I left Leeds. Immediately I defended my PhD, I had to get back home. I did not have the opportunity to go to graduate. So now, as I was preparing for this talk, that's when I wanted to, to buy one. Then these guys at uh, Ravenscroft said, well, you can borrow one. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> Never mind. What can go? Send it to me. <laughs> and then they say, no, we can't send it to Zambia. So, what's the problem? Oh, yeah, do you have anyone in UK who can send it to? Now, guys, I am a man who is rich at nieces and nephews. Very rich. <laughs> Everywhere have nieces and nephews. So we are waking up. Then we've gone into uh, heart failure. Now, in the heart failure field, we have been part of the teams that have led the new definition of heart failure. When the echo came out, everyone was very happy because the echo would give us a feeling. So if the echo says the ejection fraction is less than 45, we say, oh no, this one is a heart failure. If they say ejection fraction is about 60, no, it's not heart failure. But later on, we realize that no, 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 actually, it's not a machine which must make a diagnosis. It's the doctors who must make the diagnosis. And so they must not run, run away from the pathophysiology. And they explain these symptoms. If it is not actually, what is it? 
have now to find an affirmative type thing with the gentle fraction which is still present. We're going to have someone with a gentle fraction system. And yet there is that failure. That is that failure of present the gentle fraction. And then we have some area in between. Okay, which is called now that failure of different uh, ejection fraction. So all that we have been in there trying to guide our colleagues in coming up with a diagnosis. But now we are doing a very, very serious randomized control trial of the influenza vaccine. That, I think, is what makes a, a base for professorship. So I'm glad that at least the university has recognized that and given me that of this but uh, the last point there, just about us moving forward to treating heart failure, that we are participating in the research for treatment of heart failure, and this has taken us into the field of physiotherapy, and for the first time we have shown that just simple exercises can improve heart failure treatment, and can improve quality of life for patients just by using simple exercises. And so many thanks to physio and the expertise they are bringing into the country. Clinical practice, I cannot go over this clinical practice without talking about my experience with asymptoms and the reason why we set up symptoms. The reason why we set up symptoms, set up symptoms maybe it was it's also just part of an experiment. We wanted to have a full feel of the healthcare system exam. There are certain things that we have been pushing on. One is the issue of efficiency in attending the patient. How much needle, a door to needle time you have when you walk into the hospital and sick. How quickly does it get you to getting stabilized? And I think we did quite well in playing that field. All right, my third engagement has been with the community. Again, I'll just rush through these ones in this, uh, for the sake of time. But when it comes to health systems, again, uh, this is one study area that has taken a lot of my time. And it all started with us getting engaged with what is called health for the uh, And that is, I think, my area of uh, interest. And so when I was hearing that, you know, the government employed junior doctors who could not be paid, I was wondering, why did they talk to me? I have a solution. But this particular field of area must make me uh, acknowledge the input of nurses in my career. <laughs> nurses have come out to be brilliant when it comes to the area of human resources for health and health systems. I've interacted with them, and my main mentor, oh, my mentor, you know, though we are agents, is a professor at our house in the university. She's a nurse. And I like it. She's a proud nurse. Yeah, professor, but every time you go, I say, hey, I'm a nurse. Within the clinical arena, I've not really stayed within UTH or within the convention of medicine alone. Here, I'm meeting up the sun of us. <laughs> <laughs> not in tangible heritage. We have a way of making instructions with us and we have a way of getting uh, information from them. But we must also give up, we must also acknowledge the input of the National Science and Technology Council. For the first time, they have given funding for research at school This is the first time ever. And they gave us funds in excess of 500,000. But that's the whole of money for National Science and Technology Council. <laughs> All right. Tobacco and tobacco control. This has been another area in which we are working. People are not doing much to control uh, tobacco use. And so when they came, when they came into Zambia and said, guys, can you do research in tobacco? We were all wondering, how do we do that? I must acknowledge here the input of uh, Professor Cecilia. Again, public health. He came on board and said, well, guys, you are able to participate in Tobago because the problems that it's bringing are mostly in the cardiovascular area and we are cardiovascular scientists. I said that they want community surveys. He said, no, I'll teach you how to do community surveys. Okay? And so the battle started then. And this was the first book that came out of our work. Okay? 
you can see the title people politics and policies not again going to this issue of power but we have done quite a lot of work from 2009 to now in tobacco control and we have actually the largest databases on tobacco control in Africa right now. And so for those who do data mining, talk to us, we will give you access to our data sets. Not only uh, on issues that are looking at the policy environment, but also issues that are looking at agriculture. Okay? Do a lot of agricultural economics related to tobacco. And unfortunately, my colleague will not be here this afternoon. Jeff Drop, the editor of this book, is in the country right now. He is at Ndozo with the World Health Organization uh, workshop, which is putting uh, in place uh, the tobacco control bill. But my work in the tobacco arena made me to be known in the world of non-communicable diseases. And so in 2015, when World Health Organization was looking for specialists from Africa to join a team, Zambia WHO office asked for my CV to send it to Geneva. It was very, very competitive, very selective. But I should say I was one of the only two people who were selected from Africa to sit on that committee. Again, I think uh, the appointment to them they sent me a business class ticket to fly to Geneva. When I got there, I could just go. <laughs> well, they expected me to be fine man. Said we not only belong to the African Heart Network, but I think right now the Zambia Heart and Stroke Foundation. Now you guys are all welcome to be members then. We are trying to uh, increase our membership track this year. Please join us. And we always do the main mission of month. Uh, students from Ridgeway will know this, but for the whole month of May, we want to raise awareness of people about issues with their blood pressure. If they do they know their high blood pressure? If they do, are they on medicine? If yes, is their blood pressure treated by that medicine? If not, can we help? So that is where the Center for Primary Care is And that's where I continue to wear. And it's our hope that in the next few years, we will continue to do research in these many areas. And so we are just sitting down for growth. And if you are thinking of research, good quality research, please come and talk to us at the Center for Primary Care Research. Should be thankful to the university system that we actually have a research support center. There is a lot of money in the basic sciences field. And so, ladies and gentlemen, if you are thinking of doing research, that's where I come. After all was done, and after all was made public, so to say, I was honored to be nominated to the National Academy of Medicine, Washington. The first Zambian ever. And what is good about this, about this uh, membership is that they literally make you plan to fly within the Constitution House. My professor, Henry Hill, was Vice Chancellor of the University of Canada, and I think he said something that is very profound. Said to those of us who are humbly exploring the mysteries of science, we must project our findings and model our systems. For if correct, we have made a small contribution. But if wrong, we have forced others. Thank you, President.
all the academicians, all the students, the spouse, the family, and everybody else. I would like to thank Professor Goma for bringing us here in this manner, the manner in which he actually gave us the professorial lecture. I think leaves very little doubt as to who Professor Goma is. We are very proud of you. We all know the inherent functions of the university. This is teaching, research, and community service. And what Professor Goma has presented to us here, there's no doubt that he has done very well in all those fields. When they looked at uh, the CV for Professor Goma, they saw that he had outstanding teaching. Am I right, professors? Outstanding teaching. Outstanding research, we all saw what he had done. Outstanding community service. What more does one want? You've done us proud. So I hope the message has been captured correctly. Sometimes the things that we discover may not make sense, outright sense to the public. When you are working at the cell level, in most cases, you need people in the same field to understand. So we have problems to actually translate that kind of research to everybody else. In this field, you have to start from the cell. And Professor Goma has told us that. From the cell, then he came to the clinic, then he came to the what? To the community. So I would not want to say more, but to thank, to thank the family to Professor Goma for the support that they've given him. Because it's not easy to be a researcher and a professional at the same time, and in this case, a doctor. Most of us have been researchers, and as we do our research, most of the time, we don't see Saturdays, we don't see Sundays. So I would like to give my heart off to the family of Professor Goma, and especially the spouse, because these are the ones who suffer most. So with these very few words, please, I want to thank again and again Professor Goma, for putting us on the map. The Vice Chancellor, the Vice Chancellors from uh, a number of universities who are present here, various teams. I'm sure you'll agree with me that today we've had a really professorial lecture. For me, it's a big surprise for the sort of class that gave me the biggest problem. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm very happy to hear that in fact I produced five professors from their class. <laughs> so again, I want to congratulate Pastor Goma for the lecture that he's given this afternoon. It has been a long trip from the days when he showed a lot of youthful exuberance and inexperience, <laughs> <laughs> becoming real an authority for us in Zambia, which are the next generation of medical doctors, students, they'll be facing two main problems. <coughs> the infectious diseases which are killing a lot of our children under five years of age. We need to do a lot of research this area which are killing the other population of Zambia. Because we are really have a double problem in Zambia and in many other developing areas. So to start the research
said that the thing that we are talking about the eclampsia, with pregnancy, or hypertension in the adult, this is the way to go. You have to do this research yourselves. If you don't do it, nobody is going to do it for us. If you really want to congratulate us to come and this team for the work that they have done uh, in this area of medicine. So congratulations. Madam Deputy Vice Chancellor, the inaugural professorial addresses are very, very important indeed. The kind of information that they have actually discovered during their many researches. And I think from the presentation this afternoon, you have seen the international collaboration with many other institutions in the world. And this is the way to go for very, very a good university like the University of Zambia. We need to work with others, mobilize resources uh, to solve the problems which are affecting Zambia, but we are also affecting other countries as well. So let me say like the vision of the people who studied the University of Zambia in 1966, I think has been fulfilled. Our students will be able to now stand in front of a big audience like here to talk about what they have done in the area of research. It's really, really a big fulfillment of the vision that was envisaged when we started in Universal Zambia in 1966. And there were 300 of us who were students that time. We never actually knew that we would ever have our own professors from the students that we were actually trained. So we pay tribute right here uh, to uh, our beloved Kenneth Kaunda, to Malimu Julius Nyerere, the former president of Tanzania, who came to give the uh, political ad address in March 1966 when we opened the University of Zambia, and the vice chancellor of Pura Bay College from Sierra Leone, who was the academic case of honor, uh, who gave the inaugural address when we opened the University of Zambia in 1966. That vision is being fulfilled, and our own students are contributing to the knowledge of the world. They are contributing to the reduction of mortality, not just for children, but also for adults. At this stage, let me remind you of uh, Professor Lamy Roma who was the first Zambian Vice Chancellor of the University of Zambia. The difference between that coma and this coma is that Professor Goma was a very humble man. He was not only a great scholar and an administrator, but he was a great researcher. When we were students, we stumbled upon his book with a mosquito in the library. He even told us about the, this book. And we found out that in fact they written this very good book about the mosquito. <clears throat> and as you all know, malaria is a major problem, not just in Zambia, but all across Africa. And Professor Goldman was one of the people who did the early research on how the mosquito actually causes devastation across Africa causes underdevelopment, not just disease, but also underdevelopment. Because if the farmer is sick, for a week or two, he cannot cultivate the food that he actually eat. So malaria has a very big impact on the economic development of our countries. And our own Professor Boma initiated the research, which he did not only in Zambia, but also at my favorite university in Uganda, uh, on the issue of Mosquito, and I would like to recommend this book to my students who are here. Uh, go and find out that book on the mosquito by the first vice chancellor of the University of Zambia. Okay. The challenge to you, Mr. Dean, and to the senior university administration presidents, is that we need to begin to record the inaugural. Professorial addresses which are given by our own professor at the University of Zambia. 
the university in the world actually do this. And now in the video, in the video we record this. And so like 10 years down the line, I was a professor 10 years ago and first with professor now. 10 years down the line, a student come and recommend his students and say that go and see my inaugural address that I gave in 2018. I gave mine in 1988. I'm also very impressed that we didn't this meeting at the University of Zambia or at the UTH. This is actually a public lecture. This only brings you to the bottom of the ladder. <laughs>
further uncertainty. You need to make the right choice. Because when you make a choice, you are teaching greater outcomes. Either you prosper, like fasting as fasting always prosper, or you become very confused and you don't know which direction you want to go. And lastly, but not the least, you stand where you are. Neither you progress, nor you go backward, but you join the university as a lecturer and you retire as a lecturer. So that's what it is. Now you all of you have heard about Pastor Goma how from a lecturer led to and when the software was given to him, he didn't like it because he had done PhD. So he brought about the rule to say all the PhD should be senior lecturer. <laughs> <laughs> so who is Pastor uh, Goma? What did he do? How far he has gone and how far behind he is, where he needs to take his steps, like Professor Mukherjee said. As to go back to me, as a man, he's a pusher. He would want to push things to fulfill his vision. So. How does he push? Let me tell you. When Professor Duke became the Vice Chancellor, on the third day of his appointment, I see the call in the evening by whom? By Pastor then the Dean School of Medicine. He says, uh, Prof. Babu, you represent the Vice Chancellor as a Vice Chancellor to the Apex University Convention. He said, why does he have to choose me as a, to go over there as a vice chancellor? That was how he pushed me. He said, no, you have to go. And I had to go and represent the vice chancellor as a vice chancellor to Apex University. And Dr. John Mulenda, I said, you where Professor John Mulenda, my apologies, he is witness to it. He pushed it. What are the things he was trying to push? He wanted to harmonize university teaching hospitals with that of the University of Zambia so that we have the same status. And that was a very big step. And uh, I compliment him that he believes that we are equal partners as far as service delivery is concerned. Then, when he became dean, he was facing too many challenges. Paucity of funds, shortage of staff, and shortage of equipment to successfully implement your skills. So what kind of... <laughs> he is a uh, partner of opportunities. Now, Professor Michelo then, for the head of the Department of Community Medicine, we transferred ourselves to the public. And I was telling Charles that look, we must open up our own school. I don't know which word went from our department and crossed over to the deanery, which is next door, and whispered into Goma's ears. Then he was not a So then he immediately called a meeting of stakeholders who would make a difference. And then we decided that we, the School of Medicine had expanded such that we should have four schools. And we thank you for that, that you took our advice and really succeeded in the Ministry of Higher Education to approve School of Medicine, School of Public Health, School of uh, Biomedical Sciences and one other, four schools. So these are concoctions of Professor Goma, who really 
fucking sick. One other thing, neither the VP Vice Chancellor talked about, nor anybody else knows about it. I know it. And that was, how did he become a professor? First time when he applied, I think the promotion committee got confused. Because what were his applications? They were on the administration of the data bill. And what kind of problems of finance, of administration, staffing, and all those things, the first four papers were on the maintenance of a dinner. Now they said that he's a professor of physiology. Why are they talking about administration? So I said, if he didn't talk about it, you will not want to know the sustainability of the school. And so they understood. Point was taken. Then he wrote a paper on ethics. Finally, I told first that in your field, you must publish at least four papers. He took the hint and through the physiological sciences on cardiovascular diseases, he did publish and he was recommended to be an associate professor. For that advice, he could have told me, who the hell are you? You are a public health man. So what are you telling me about cardiovascular disease? But that, he took the advice and it helped me to stabilize. It opened a new avenue for Professor Goma. All this time he was talking, people were asking him where is the evidence. So in order to get the evidence, who does he go to? Professor Patrick Fusonda, who is a statistician. So he taught him about to look into the p-values, statistical significance, and other things. And he found an answer to cardiovascular diseases. The professor had got hypertension. Maybe there's a lot of events in the direction of the wind. And that is what today I am just coming from the meeting where I went on to on prevention and control of tobacco. And I must tell you that the 65 people from all the different constituencies who came to attend that meeting spells of a hundred percent political will. And Professor Goma is single-handedly responsible of bringing the way for the welfare of the people as far as tobacco control is concerned. 50% of our people who smoke uh, and their families are all affected by either direct smoke or passive smoking or unwanted smoking. So this is one aspect which has taken me. And uh, before I end, I want to tell you something. All these things are happening, why? Why there are so many diseases? Why the classification of diseases is become very short? It's no longer 10 years. Six or seven years time, the classification has changed. According to my experience, I'm hearing somewhere around eight, let's say 60% of my profession is in the school of public health. It's because we have successfully, continuously failed in primary prevention. If the primary prevention would be successful, there would not be any NCDs or the communicable diseases which are prevented. In Zambia, in 19, till 1980, 79, we did not have any cholera, we did not have any typhoid, we did not have water one diseases. Our immunization had gone up to 65%. And then, then, President said, now our life expectancy will go up. Our life expectancy is 45 now. After the impact of malaria, HIV, AIDS, and cardiovascular disease in cities. Mr. Goma, you've taken a very bold step. I pray to the Lord Almighty God that you submit yourself come to Him and he advises you in accordance to live in his own image. And now, I won't say much. May I call upon one of my other classmates, 
that is uh, Professor Charles Mchero, to come and uh, give a, a word of thanks. Let me begin on the last moment. I, I don't know, can you all see me? <laughs>
belong to two separate departments. And then an institution at national level, ECOS, the diploma training programs at all the colleges in Zambia. The one thing I remember very well is when he wanted now to make me substantive head of that department, he calls me and he says, Man, are you past my house? Yes, boss. I get there, he says, I need you to run DNA, the Department of Medical Education Development. I said, but I can't manage. I've got enough on my plate as it is. Pathologist waiting. I've got, he says, I know what you've been doing. If it's too much for you, give me one way of someone who is available right now. And I'll take that person into that department. Me. So he is also a tactician. <laughs> Very serious strategist. I think he had already rehearsed our conversation. He knew what I was going to say here, the answers. And I take my head off to him because if I had not gone through those five years of, I don't know how I did it, as the big man upstairs, Namdawa. He might know how I did it. But at the end of the day, Today, I am the dean of the School of Medicine for a job I did not apply for. There's something this man saw in me which I didn't know. I think we are selfish things like our mother countries. I am very demanding and I push hard. And when I have timelines, they are casting stone. You don't speak. Movement. Those who know fast one, does that sound familiar? <laughs> I think it does. I don't want to bore you a lot, but I owe this man a big thank you for who I am today in Zambia, for who I am internationally. I could have done it without him pushing me into a corner and asking me to deliver on everything. My brother. Um, when he speaks of 
a flag flying, there has been a flag flying in great places in Washington, D.C. and presenting. It's just such an inspiration for me as an aspiring clinical scientist and I'm sure for all of us to see where, where can we raise this and in fact, where can we represent, how can we represent. And so, Professor, congratulations. As Professor Mayumu said, you have been every accolade um, and we are so grateful to you.
and see how uh, uh, life and living is made of. And uh, we are happy, I'm happy to recognize and thank the presence of our dead vice chancellor. Thank you very much. Uh, Could you just come and go to us in the 